Good evening. For years we worried that the likes of Google, Microsoft and Facebook knew too much about us. But when the American intelligence contractor Edward Snowden revealed a list of secret programs the US and British intelligence services have been working on, it seemed the state had amassed a capability beyond all expectations, intercepting and storing vast amounts of everyday internet traffic. The power and scale of the intelligence gathering surprised many concerned about the level of intrusion it represented. But should we be worried? Given the vast amount of data generated online, is it any wonder they require the most powerful systems to find the pieces of information that might, say, prevent a terrorist attack? But just how much state intelligence gathering are we prepared to accept? Here's the BBC security correspondent, Gordon Carrera. Piece by piece over the last few months, we've got glimpses of something that was previously hidden. Top secret documents leaked by former American intelligence analyst Edward Snowden have revealed a huge web of intelligence gathering run by Britain's GCHQ and America's NSA. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. This is the truth, this is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. You have to have a powerful capability to find the small amount that you're looking for. But it doesn't mean that the state is reading everyone's emails. The NSA's actions have more than undermined internet security. Um, they have threatened to break the internet. In the same way technology has transformed our daily lives, it's revolutionised the world of intelligence. The way in which modern communications flow is dizzyingly complex. I might send an email to someone from my phone using software provided by a company like Google's Gmail or Microsoft's Hotmail. The data will be broken up into tiny packets which might travel along an international fibre optic cable, part of a global telecoms infrastructure. The message might also be encrypted by a company's complex algorithm designed to make sure no one can read it along its journey until it reaches the person whom it's addressed to. What we've learned from the Edward Snowden revelations is that America's NSA and Britain's GCHQ are developing the capability to target communications at every point along the route. The NSA has a program called PRISM, which allows it to get hold of data from software companies like Microsoft and Google. Under Tempora, GCHQ is tapping the international fibre optic cables through which vast amounts of data and individual messages pass. And the two intelligence agencies are working to crack the secret encryption codes so that they can read messages which other people thought were secret. They also hoover up a huge amount of information about communications, so-called metadata, which they can then sift and analyse, looking for patterns and connections. The overall ambition is enormous, to be able to reach into the global stream of digital communications and pluck out a single message and then read it. So, with so much of our lives online leaving a digital trail behind, has the state, without anyone knowing, become Big Brother? Uh, a little over one month ago, I had a family, a home in paradise. That's what Edward Snowden believed. He's now in hiding in Russia. A hero to some, a villain to others. How you see him depends on how surprised and how outraged you are by what he's revealed. Thanks to Edward Snowden, The Guardian has got hold of a massive trove of top secret documents from the NSA, as well as 58,000 from Britain's GCHQ. So far it's published just a few excerpts. In the last week I've been given direct access to a small selection of original documents held outside the UK. These form the basis of some of the stories The Guardian has already published. The capabilities they reveal and the secrets they contain make clear the very real issues in balancing the public interest with national security. Those who've worked inside the secret state though say that this power is vital for national security 
and is used only for national security. What the state needs and law enforcement needs is the possibility of accessing the communications of the terrorists, the criminals, the kidnappers, the proliferators, the paedophiles. But those communications are all mixed up with everyone else's communications. There are 204 million emails a minute buzzing around the globe. So you have to have a powerful capability to find the small amount that you're looking for. But it doesn't mean that the state is reading everyone's emails, nor would that conceivably be feasible. You say the state isn't reading everyone's emails, but people might fear they could be reading my emails. Well, I'd put the proposition the other way around. Would you really support a world in which it was not possible for the police and the intelligence agencies to find the communications of the terrorists and the proliferators and the criminals and the kidnappers. But can we trust the state? Technology allows it to do things it could never have done before, collecting and sifting through billions of records to find a connection or reconstructing a person's social interactions. The programmes are innovative and highly complex. And while there is a system of oversight and accountability, for instance every search has to be justified under the Human Rights Act, critics feel this system is not strong enough. The controls that exist at the moment, the commissioners and so on, frankly far, far too small. They couldn't conceivably check every intercept uh, 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 of the sort that Snowden exposed. It's simply not possible. The mechanism isn't there. Is your theory is mission creep? That something which is justified in terms of national security is expanded into intruding into all our privacy? Well, yes, or the, or the scope to do so, yes, and, and the, the relatively unfettered scope to do so. Now, people keep turning around saying, oh, we're responsible people. Look, you know, I, I know some of the, the, the people in, involved in this, and they are decent, civilised people. But you know, the state simply shouldn't have these powers, because one day they get used wrongly, you know, and uh, uh, by then it's too late. As well as processing vast amounts of data, the Snowden files also point to the intelligence agencies deliberately undermining some of the security protocols on the internet, like the process of encryption, with the goal of making it easier for them to gain access to data. For us, the um, revelations in early September that the NSA had had a major covert programme to compromise internet security standards and products uh, were a 9-11 moment. Some leading computer security experts have been left outraged. They've spent decades trying to make sure people can communicate securely and privately over the internet. The goal of the NSA and GCHQ is to ensure that this is not the case, that they can break anybody's privacy at any time and that they can interfere with any transaction at any time. In order to do this, they have compromised in various ways many of the protocols on which the internet relies. Now, when you introduce these vulnerabilities, they're not just available for the spies to use, they're available for bad guys to use as well. The files confirm the scale of what's been built, but they also contain page after page of top secret information. For instance, GCHQ's work in supporting military operations overseas. So by making this material vulnerable to those who want to know Britain's secrets and in disclosing certain aspects of it, have Edward Snowden's actions compromise national security? Not even the KGB in its heyday of Philby and Burgess and Maclean in the 1950s could have dreamt of acquiring 58,000 highly classified intelligence documents. My fear is that we're now going to witness a slow motion car crash in which gradually sources dry up, uh, targets such as terrorists uh, and, and cyber uh, criminals will work out what are the kind of capabilities uh, that we have and they will adapt their methods. It will be harder to track them down. The state has amassed enormous powers when it comes to interception and it's done so in secret. That concerns many who believe there needs to be more public knowledge about the state's capability and more consent to its use of those powers.
Secrecy is the antagonist of accountability, always is. Uh, it, sometimes you can't get around it. You know, you've got to have secret agencies, you've got to have spies, you've got to have ways of dealing with your enemies. Nobody disputes that. But you've also got to have, in a free society, uh, a way of keeping it under control, making sure it doesn't run away. They pushed it even further than we thought they would. Um, the surprising thing to us was that there appear to have been occasional pockets of competence within the NSA and GCHQ. Many of us had for many years thought the real secret was that, like other large public sector IT projects, it didn't work and there was really nobody there. But to find that they had built this machine and got it working was an eye-opener. The balance between secrecy and accountability is being shifted as a direct result of Snowden's disclosures. A senior US intelligence official acknowledged to me there would now have to be more transparency about the NSA's work. But as the public understands more about the powerful machine that's been built in secret, how far will it be confident that it's being used to keep us safe rather than spy on us? Gordon Carrera, well, Glenn Greenwald is the journalist responsible for releasing the information leaked by Edward Snowden. He joins us from Rio. Good evening, Glenn Greenwald. Um, first of all, why should Good you evening. be the arbiter about what is in the public interest and what is vital to national security? I'm not the arbiter of that. I work with a huge number of Guardian editors and some of the most experienced national security journalist in the world and journalism which is designed to serve as a check on those in power is about shining light on what those people who are in power are doing that they try and hide from the public and those are the judgments that all journalism requires every single day. Um, 58,000 British documents we know, uh, at least as many presumably from the NSA. Um, you heard perhaps Sir David uh, Oman there from the former GCHQ uh, chief saying you're not even Philby, Burgess and McLean uh, had such an impact as this and this is a car crash coming. Well, this idea that there's 58,000 documents just because the UK government said it, I would hope that we've learned the lesson after the Iraq war that government claims are not tantamount to the truth. But I think the broader point is that it isn't how many documents The Guardian or other newspapers around the world possess. The question is, what is it that they're doing with those documents? And in every single article that we've published and in every single article that we will publish, we have very carefully gone over every single line of every single document and not one line, not one comma, of what we published could even possibly be said to damage national security. It's but, all about informing people and democracies of what their governments are doing. But what you have shown is, as it were, the, the huge metadata connections. Now, those connections are often made to track would-be terrorists as a very result of those being known to people all over the world. Terrorists, would-be terrorists, change their tactics. So it is very possible that you actually, by your actions, make it easier for terrorists to understand how to evade all the checks that are made on them online. That's completely ludicrous. First of all, the premise of your question is entirely false. We've shown much more than just the mere collection of metadata. We've shown all sorts of invasions into the content of communications between innocent people having conversations with one another online through emails, online chat, collection of their browsing history. The idea that terrorists didn't know, excuse me, that the United States and UK governments were trying to monitor their communications is laughable. Of course, every terrorist who's capable of tying their own shoes has long known that the UK and US governments are trying to monitor Wait, their communications. But, but, the only but, thing we've informed people of is that the spying system is aimed at them. But what I want to ask you is how can you be sure that your actions have not made it easier for terrorist dropper. You can't be sure of that. You can't prove a negative like that, can you? Well, I don't know why you're asking me to prove a negative. Well, I'm just simply saying that I'm, the, I, way I'm, that, the way that 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 human beings reason and that journalists make decisions is that you weigh all of the competing evidence as rationally as you can. And we know that the evidence that we are disclosing to the world is not about spying on terrorists that they don't already know about, but spying on innocent human beings. And I would like to find a journalist or a human being who says, I would rather remain ignorant about what my government is doing in a democracy. That is not how a healthy democracy 
functions. But do you think it will be such a shock that spies actually do spy, or do you think actually for a, 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 a majority of the population perhaps, it actually might be quite reassuring. They might actually feel quite safe. I think it's a shock that government officials lie to the face of journalists who don't seem to mind very much. So for example, in that segment that you just played, you had people defending the GCHQ on the grounds that this is only about terrorism or pedophiles. And yet, much of the reporting that we've done proves that's a lie. We, we reported that the GCHQ and NSA are spying on Petrobras, the large Brazilian oil company that funds social programs in Brazil. Are there terrorists in Petrobras? Or that they're spying on the Organization of American States when they're negotiating economic agreements? Are there pedophiles at the OAS? So I think that the job of journalists is to prevent people in power from lying to the people over whom that they over whom they're ruling and while some of this may be devoted to terrorists huge amounts of this system are devoted to innocent people in the population you, whose privacy is being eroded let you there's vast amounts of material I, I gather that you have that still has not been revealed uh, at the moment I mean do you have this is it in your bedroom in Rio I'm not going to talk about what's in my bedroom, and I'm not going to talk about the security measures. What I will say, but I mean, do you is have? That it? I mean, it's possible that presumably you have a little. Let me, they, let me just. Let me, let, no, no, is, uh, people want to know. Is, I'll be happy. To, I'll tell you why people want to know. They want to know, I suppose, that how can you guarantee that the material you have, you can keep safe? I mean, the thing is, you know, could it possibly be on a memory stick in your pocket? I mean, people want to know how you think you can keep things safe. Well, I'll be happy to answer that. That was what I was about to tell you when you interrupted. There's only one group of people who has lost control of huge amounts of what they claim are important documents. And those people are called the GCHQ and the NSA. The GCHQ <laughs> took documents that they claim are so very sensitive and put them onto a system at the NSA that tens of thousands of people have access to. We at The Guardian have protected all of our data with extremely advanced methods of encryption, and our documents have remained completely secure. We have not lost control of any of our material. That remains entirely secure. The reason I ask that is because when your partner, and as it were, I suppose, collaborator um, um, uh, David Miranda was apprehended in the evidence, it said that actually what he was doing, he was carrying around password material, written a piece of paper uh, beside the encrypted files. To a lot of people, that is not very worrying about how uh, careful you are about security. Right. Well, I guess I need to give you the reminder again that as a journalist, you should be aware that simply because the government makes a claim, especially when they're making that claim in the middle of a lawsuit while they're being sued for violating the law, one should not go around assuming that claim to be factually true. So the it's UK wrong. government so you're claim that it. my partner was carrying a pass. It was, a, it was a lie. The idea that he was carrying a password that allowed access to those documents and to let people open those documents and read them is absolutely false. The only ones who have lost control of the documents through horrific operational security is the GCHQ and the NSA. He did not have the password. And I will show you the proof of that. Just look at the affidavit that they filed that said we have to keep this material because it's all, quote, heavily encrypted and we've only been able to reconstruct 75 of those documents. They filed an affidavit themselves proving that what they've convinced you of is actually a lie. Well, I, I, after uh, what happened to David Miranda when he was held and so forth, and, I, and you know, as his partner, that must have been uh, very distressing for you. You then said, I'll be far more aggressive in my reporting from now. I'm going to publish many more documents. I'm going to publish things on England too. I have many documents on England's spy system. I think they'll be sorry for what they did. Um, is there something coming down the pipeline? Because that's a number of months ago now. Right. Actually, it was a few weeks ago. Um, I think it was four weeks ago. And since then, there has been a report, as I said, on Fantastico about GCHQ spying on Petrobras, which caused a major diplomatic scandal with, uh, with, with, the, with, with Brazil. Um, but that interview that you're referencing is, is in Portuguese, and you're, the translation you're reading from is very poor. What I was asked was, how do you think the, the British government's behavior, both toward the Guardian and toward your partner, will be viewed? And I said, it'll be looked at in most democracies where press freedoms are protected, unlike in the UK, um, as a very thuggish form of behavior and an attack on journalism that will make them look quite bad. I think it's contrary to their interests and they'll come to regret it. It had nothing to do 
do with vowing to do revenge journalism, as some tried to depict. But we will continue absolutely aggressively reporting on both the GCHQ and the NSA. But, but, do, you, but do you see why, however inappropriate the translation was, that it was seen very much as, you know, are you acting as a campaigner and an activist? I kind of, you talked about revenge journalism being the wrong way of describing it, but you can see how people think that. No, I'll tell you my view of journalism very clearly. My view of journalism is that the more people in power abuse that power, the more accountability and transparency they prove that they need through journalism. And so when I see a government like the UK barge into the newsroom of the newspaper with which I work and demand that they destroy their computers, something you would expect to hear in Iran or Russia or China, or when they detain someone they think is working with a journalist under a terrorism law for nine hours and basically acknowledge through the media that they're doing it to be intimidating, that is a government that is attacking press freedom and abusing their power and showing that they need more transparency and that's the role of journalism. So, uh, Glenn Greenwald, do you fear for your safety? Those, that's no, I don't. That's not something I, I focus on. The Brazilian government has actually offered me and provided security, and I'm perfectly content and, um, with the situation I'm in. Lots of journalists are in difficult positions all the time, uh, so it's not something I but think do, about. But do you, feel, do you feel you could travel further afield? For example, do you feel you could travel, one, to the United States, and two, do you feel uh, comfortable about traveling to Britain? Well, I am going to return to the United States as soon as I, I decide that it makes sense to do so because unlike in the UK, there's actually a constitutional guarantee of a free press. And I think lots of even former Obama Justice Department officials have said it's unthinkable that the Obama administration would prosecute the journalists in this case. The UK is a different story because that government has proven that they are willing to very thuggishly run roughshod over press freedoms. They're threatening criminal investigations. They detain my partner under a terrorism law. They force the Guardian to destroy their laptops. So I am much more cautious about traveling to the UK, although not being able to visit the UK is not really something I regard as a particularly great punishment. Are you still in touch uh, with Edward Snowden? Sure, he's my source and, and somebody I care about and I speak with him regularly. Uh, you speak with him regularly and how do you uh, know how he is being treated and how do you know, more importantly, whether he hasn't had to give up secrets if he's under Russian protection? Because unlike the UK government and the US government, Mr. Snowden's statements have proven to be completely true in every single instance. I've never once seen him lie to me about anything. I know for a fact that he has protected the data that he has with extreme levels of encryption that not even the NSA, let alone the lesser Russian intelligence agencies can so, crack. And he didn't unravel his life to fight surveillance but, in order to then go to the Russians and help them surveil. No, but he, but he has been through China, obviously in Hong Kong, and he's in Russia now. You can't be sure that he hasn't had to give up something. Well, you pointed out very astutely just a few minutes ago that nobody can prove a negative. So if you're looking for me to prove to you mathematically that they don't have any data, I can't do that. What I can do is tell you that all of the evidence that we do actually know makes it ludicrous to think that they have obtained any of that data. There's zero evidence that they have and any responsible journalist would re refrain from suggesting that that happened when they have no evidence that it did. I wonder, though, uh, with Edward Snowden, whether or not um, his position in Russia, I mean, you know, if he tried to travel, look what happened, look what the Americans did, uh, you know, to the presidential plane, the Bolivian presidential plane, over European territory. Does he really feel all that safe? The Russians have only said they would keep him for a year. Well, remember, he didn't choose to be in Russia. He was trying to pass through Russia, and the United States government basically forced him to be there by revoking his passport and preventing other countries from letting him transit through. But he certainly, given the alternative, which is a supermax prison in the United States where he's disappeared for the next 40 years, I think he's quite content to be where he is. It's interesting, because this is, in some ways, the elements of a spy film, because when you first met him, I understand that, how did you identify him when you first met him? Right. I had no idea uh, how old he was, who he was, what he looked like before I first met him. And so the plan was he had asked us to go to a part of the hotel where he was staying in at a designated time. And he said that he would enter that room and we would know him because he was carrying a Rubik's Cube. 
Um, and we went at the designated time. He wasn't there. We came back at the second time that he had given us. Um, he showed up a couple of minutes later carrying a Rubik's cube, and, and that was how so, we knew that it was our source that we had been so, communicating. So finally, with. finally, I want to ask you because we, we've gone from that kind of kind of extraordinary kind of spy film thing to the idea that he actually might end up in an American supermax prison. Do you think ultimately he might indeed end up in an American prison? Well, when we were in Hong Kong, he had assumed, I think we were all assuming that that was going to be the likely outcome of the brave choice that he had made, which is what made it so brave. I think now it's a lot more difficult because the, his reporting is considered heroic by huge numbers of people around the world. And I think it's made it much more difficult for the U.S. government to get their hands on him and, and basically disappear him and make it so that he's never heard from again. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, thank you very much indeed. Um, now let's discuss this further uh, with Baroness Pauline Neville-Jones, the former chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee, and Antti Barnett, the founder of Open Democracy. Um, shouldn't we have been told about all of this stuff anyway? No, oh, well, <clears throat> I think uh, the government does have to have powers, actually, to protect us. I mean, uh, the extraordinary uh, things that were being said by, by Glenn Greenwald, uh, in particular, the most astounding thing, which I simply don't credit that he actually believes, that the Russians aren't and the Chinese aren't in full possession now of, of both technique and information. So you actually believe oh, yes. Edward this Snowden is Oh, this is extremely damaging. Now, I think why, one why, do you th think why do you believe that to be the case? Well, because, I mean, the, the Russian capabilities are very good. He has absolutely no defences against them. Uh, they will have taken possession of his, of his computer <coughs> and they will have gone into them. And I don't think there's any doubt at all that they are now have a great deal of information which, it would, which is damaging to our security uh, and which you know, uh, is, is the result of um, betrayal on the part of a trusted employee. Well, I know that you left, as it were, the <coughs> services a while ago, but did you know all this was going on? Well, look, the, the, the world has changed with the internet. I mean, we talk about, the, the people who are worried about this talk about this huge explosion in surveillance. It's a function of the massive increase in the transmission of communication. So you knew it was happening? Which means, no, interception has always taken place. You can intercept the mails, you can intercept telephone calls. Is the government, act, does, do people believe that's happening? No. Why should they therefore think that when in a situation where you have enormous ex, uh, expansion of communications, which requires for, for purposes of protection then to have comparable powers of, of, of collection in order to be intercept to find the tiny bits that really matter, that all the rest of it is being read. It is not, Kirsty. It's not being read. It is no. only there to, for, to it's, catch the few. It's not about tiny bits, uh, Kirsty. I mean, I spent a political lifetime telling people, mainly on the left, not to be paranoid. You know, Thatcher was not introducing fascism. Blair was not creating a dictatorship. We now face the greatest threat to our liberties since the Second World War. We're sleepwalking into despotism. Because, because of the amount of material that is being collected, because the, these databases, which are not about tiny items of information, will be used, and not just by governments. Snowden was, was working for a corporation. They will be accessed by others than government. And because, perhaps most important of all, people will start to self-censor. We will find that the very fact of our surveillance, of the total surveillance of our activities, means that we are going to start. But it's, not, it's not a question, as, as the foreign minister said, of, of if you haven't done anything wrong, you have nothing to fear. This structure of surveillance will stop us doing things that are right, that we know we but should do be doing. But do you think we have, uh, we have slept walked into this in the sense that, you know, Paul and Neville Jones will say there are checks and balances, but do you think people actually understand the nature? of metadata and how it operates and the connections that are made. No, and that's partly the fault of the BBC's own reporting because people, you know, metadata, as one person said, we don't talk about metadata, everyone will fall, to, fall asleep. Well, actually, nobody fell so asleep the, during Gordon's period. No, Ferris, I agree, though. I agree. It's very, very important. But there is a pattern. We, are, we now have an electronic life from our, uh, the, the GPS in our telephone to our texts to, to the web pages we access. And what, what the uh, intelligence services are doing is they're gathering billions, 20 billion items of uh, information. Yeah, but but okay, Glenn Greenwald no, is right. No, 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 let me just finish this. And they are creating a pattern of how we live. So it's not about reading the content of the email. It's not about getting no, the content. It's, it's about It's about mapping who we are. But Glenn Greenwald's right, there, isn't it? Yeah. Terrorism would be terrorists. You know, are smart. Now, they, 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 they've known this has been happening. They've presumably known they this has been happening. They still have to communicate. Years. Of course they know. They take risks. 
Uh, they still know, Nobody they still have is to communicate. against listening they, to the communication they, of terrorists. You have that to find them the in issue. the first place. And, and that nobody is why you is have against to collect material. I mean, I'm sorry. It, it, you can't know where these things... You have to actually go through the data in order to get... The, the, the clues that enable you actually then to but put then, the but sorry, thing was that what does it matter what does it matter what the Brazilians are doing at Petrograd that's the I, point isn't it what does it matter the problem is isn't it that this you might be going after terrorists but actually there's lots of other interests it's in about here social that control that, 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 that actually yes, can, and using I, it for I business entirely reasons accept, I entirely and, accept, you, and I agree so how do you there does it? need to be control over the system yep. there does need to be accountability and, in it okay do you and believe there's enough control I, what I do believe is that they're acting according to law. I do believe, on the other hand, that given the, the public anxiety that's been aroused by this, that we do need to have actually some a body like the Information and Security, Intelligence and Security Committee, actually do a review. So, in a way, is that, that, really is that a good thing then? I'm, is it a way no, not I'm in the pocket? Sorry, I'm sorry. Can can I I just, I just, metadata is not law. under the law. Nor metadata is the, not a law. It is acting beyond the law at the moment. And Did that's that. This is a crucial point here. And the idea that the intelligence services sit there saying, "Give us all the raw data we need a clue and search through," is but absurd. D but if you if actually, you know just, if you on, have on, a clue, I just then you have access to track I, something. Can I just put something to you that was in uh, Gordon Carrera's mm. film that actually there has been a deliberate undermining by the security services of encryption. The intent, there's always been a tension, which is which is not new, not new, between. The, 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 the need for security and the ability also to intercept uh, communications. This is, not a, this is not a new tension. Would you say, hand on heart, that yeah. actually, in a way, because you think there should be a review, that Glenn Greenwald was right? No, absolutely not. No, he I don't. No, and I do right. think, but I do no think no that question the, that, that he's the, done a huge public what service. The, what the what the ISC, the Intelligence and Security Committee, needs to do is actually in the House of Commons. It's a, it's a joint committee of yeah. both houses of very senior MPs. So there's no reason to suppose they're in the government's in pocket. The pocket. But if you were to, they are not if in the you were to, If you were to put one thing to Glenn... Any more than the judges who act as information commissioners if, are, in the, are handmaidens of the executive. If you were to put one thing to Glenn mm. Greenwell, what would no. it be? Would it be about having given up secrets already? You're sure of it? I, I think it's no way that that, uh, that that young man will have been able to resist. Can I just put that to you, Glenn Greenwald, that here is a very senior uh, intelligence expert in this country saying there is no way, no way on earth that Edward Snowden has not had to give up something in Russia or indeed perhaps before that in China. The ignorance of those comments is truly astounding to me. The, first of all, you would think that a rational person, before making an extremely serious accusation, like Russia and China has gotten all of his data, would have at least a little bit of evidence before saying that. There is none. What is the, okay. what, what is the let, basis let for me just put that, let, sensation let, in the well, stomach? Okay. But, 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 no, but please let me just make yeah. the point. I listened for a long time. I just want to make this point. There's, sh she said he probably, they, they got the data on his laptops. That isn't how data works. It's not 1998. Data is, is stored on thumb drives. And on those thumb drives are very sophisticated means of encryption shells that, as I said before, and I know this because I've read the documents that I have on this, not even the NSA can break. The encryption codes are 4,000 characters long. He doesn't even have them and okay, let me let me let, let me just put that to they point level. Because that's a clarification. He doesn't well, even have them. I mean, yeah. He doesn't I, have them. I, no. I, I mean, I just don't think... Um, I, I don't believe any of the any of the that. Uh, I mean, the, the Russians have got very sophisticated uh, capabilities. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>